The Kruger National Park is a magical place. If you've ever been there, you'll know that there's just something special in that place. There's something amazing and peaceful about the raw nature and the beauty of the place. The park spans two of South Africa's provinces, Limpopo and Pumalanga, and covers 1,945 square kilometers. You know, that's bigger than Wales. Not like the whale, the whale, like the mammal, but Wales, the country, like it's bigger than an entire country, but it's within our country. It's pretty impressive. So for a while now, I've been a bit curious about Kruger's history. So I'm going to tell you a very brief version of that story. Well, I'll try to be brief because it's quite a big history, but uh, let's go. So the area of the park has been occupied by humans for many, many, many years. There is evidence of people living in the area of the park uh, since the earlier middle and latter stone ages. Rock paintings in the caves of the park show evidence of the sand people having lived in the area for a really long time. There are actually over 420 archaeological sites within the park for you to go look at and to show and that attest to human habitation in the park for many, many years. So the first European travelers moved down from Dalagoa Bay in Mozambique into the game reserve in 1725 while in search of some trade routes and trade opportunities south. They crossed only three kilometers northeast of the present day Crocodile Bridge Rest Camp. And therefore, the expedition members that were on this expedition would be considered the first Europeans to enter the park. Well, it wasn't a park then, but the area of the park. Uh, these uh, adventurers, I guess you could say, uh, clashed with the local indigenous warriors when they entered the park and then were forced to retreat back to where they came from, Mozambique. It's only a uh, hundred years later, so more than a hundred years later, that the foot trackers arrived from the Cape, coming up from the Cape, up towards the northern area. hundred years later, the foot trackers arrived in the area in 1836, but they struggled with malaria and sleeping sickness whatever sleeping sickness is, research that, and moved out onto the escarpment where they could descend and graze their cattle in winter. And then they also went into the park to hunt the abundant game. Again, it wasn't a park then, but still. Uh, Louis Trichart, who's one of the fur trackers, and most of his followers actually died during the journey um, because of disease, etc. And there's actually a memorial in the park which commemorates Louis Trichart. So in the late 1800s, there was a lot of drama around getting a reserve set up in this area. There were two Republican officials, G.J. Lowe and Abel Erasmus, who proposed that a game reserve should be set up in this area. There's abundant wildlife, why don't we have a game reserve? But the government did not really initially respond to these proposals. They're like, meh, why? We have another game reserve, it's fine. The matter was raised again in 1893 and again in 1895, but the government was still like, meh, not super interested in the idea. Uh, so then two other members of the Volksrat, which is like the government, I guess, R.K. Loveday and J.L. Van Veik also joined and they took matters into their own hands. They submitted a motion and a debate took place on the 17th of September, 1895. The Volksrat, the government, I guess, agreed and said that they would proclaim a nature reserve in this area, but they didn't, this government. Love Day once again took up this matter in November 1897 and still nothing happened from that. These people really wanted a park and the government really didn't really care. But at last on the 29th of December 1897, the Executive Council discussed the matter and three months later, President Paul Kruger, Kruger, see, proclaimed the government Wilt Tain. I don't speak Afrikaans, but Governmenta Wilt Tain which was also known as the Sabi Game Reserve on March 26, 1898. Due to the lack of funds, two members of the Zeit Afrikaanse Republic Polisi were instructed to patrol the area of the park. However, the 9th of October, 1899, saw the outbreak of the Second Boer War, which put further delays in place. So then the place was kind of not looked after for a while. In the last months of the war in 1902, the British administration led by Lord Milner decided to re-proclaim the Sabi Game Reserve. So it was like, hey, this was a park, no longer a park. Now they're like, yay, re-proclaim, here's the park, Sabi Game Reserve, you got a park. 
After a letter from the Secretary of Native Affairs dated 22nd of April 1903, the Shingwitzi Nature Reserve or Game Reserve was proclaimed without much pushback. So like, hey, let's expand. They built the Shingwitzi Nature Reserve. Nobody pushed back. So like, hey, another park. This meant that apart from the triangular shaped area between the Lataba and Olifans rivers, all of the Eastern Transvaal low felt from the Crocodile River in the south to the Levuvu River in the north was now a game reserve. This included Crook's Corner, where the borders of South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe all meet together. This area, Crook's Corner, is actually kind of cool because in the 1900s, it was a safe haven for gun runners, poachers, fugitives, and anyone else trying to dodge the law. It was just easy to hop across the river when the police came from one country to another. So if they came from South Africa, hop back into Mozambique. Zimbabwe, so they kind of just like chilled there. That's why there's Crook's Corner, visited, really cool place. Anyway, going back to the early pioneers of the park. In July 1902, Major James Stevenson Hamilton was appointed as game warden of the Sabi Game Reserve. He's an important guy, and he was quite an important part of the foundation of the park. He was Scottish from birth, and he came to South Africa as a soldier. He fell in love with the country, and he actually didn't want to return to the UK, so he was like, hey, what can I do here? That's why he became the warden of the park. Stevenson Hamilton was not really sure what to expect and what was expected of him as the warden. And when he asked uh, his superior, so Godfrey Lagden, he was famously told, go down there and make yourself thoroughly disagreeable to everyone. So that's kind of what he did. He was very disagreeable, but he did get quite a lot done in the park. For the first few months, Stevenson Hamilton stayed at Crocodile Bridge. Then he moved to Sabi Bridge, where he had his headquarters. He thoroughly explored his domain and appointed the first game wardens, both black and white. In 1903, he managed to stop the movement of cattle through the park. So previously it was used as a route, cattle would graze. He stopped that. He also managed to stop all people prospecting for coal and minerals. In 1903, Harry Volater was also appointed as a game ranger in the park. There's actually a famous story about Mr. Volata. It's quite intense. In 1904, he was attacked by two lions and he managed to kill one of them with his sheath knife. Like a, a small knife. Pretty impressive. Volata proceeded to climb into a tree uh, before the second lion could actually get to him. He believes that he was saved by his dog, Bull, who kept barking incessantly at the lion and the lion eventually like, kind of left it. Um, Volata's assistant then arrived and carried him back to camp. Volata's knife and the skin of the lion he killed are actually on display in the Stevenson Hamilton Library in Skukuza today, so you can go check it out. So back to the history. In 1914, the First World War started and Stevenson Hamilton joined the forces in the north. So he actually left the administration of the reserves to a ranger called Cecil Richard de la Porte and after that a Major A.A. Fraser. Upon his return in 1920, he was sad because he found everything in shambles. Fraser had let the administration slip into a mess. Further concerns surrounded the fact that the war had stimulated development. Greedy eyes were looking at the reserve for agricultural use. Stevenson Hamilton fought on every front to save the reserves, and he was instrumental in establishing the Salati railway line, which was originally built to transport gold. However, the gold reserve soon began to dwindle, and in 1922, in an attempt to increase the profits of the railroads, the Round in Nine tour was established. This is really cool. It was actually a nine day tour of Mozambique and the Low Fault and included a one night stop at what is the present day Skukuza. Uh, the idea was allowing people into the reserve. And that was where the idea of allowing them into the reserve was even born. Stevenson Hamilton got members of the provincial council to visit the reserve on one of these tours. And they left with a better understanding of the possibilities of a national park. In 1926, the Parliament of the Union of South Africa passed a National Parks Act, and that's when they renamed the reserve to the Kruger National Park as it is today. In 1927, the gates of the park opened to the public for the first time, and the entry was just one pound per person. Only three cars actually entered the park on the first day, but that number continued to grow, and by 1930, 900 cars entered the park during that year. The construction of roads continued to grow during the 30s and by 1934 about 1,200 kilometers of roads had been completed within the park. In 1935 to 1946, Eileen Orpen bought and donated a large amount of farms totaling 24,528 hectares. There's actually a memorial plaque in her honor, so pretty cool. What a generous lady. 
in the 1940s, World War II broke out. And that also had a slight impact on the park due to petrol rationing. There was only a certain portion of the park that was open to people, but only lasted for a short period of time. And by 1946, the park was back fully operational. And by the end of 1948, 58,000 people visited the park in that year. Hamilton, Stevenson Hamilton was replaced as warden by Colonel J.A.B. Sanderberg of the South African Air Force. And then after that, Louis Stain succeeded Sanderberg in 1954. In 1955, the number of visitors exceeded 100,000 for the first time. In 1959, work commenced to build a fence around the entire park's boundaries. Warden Stain retired in 1961. He was replaced by the chief biologist, A.M. Brynard, who took on the new title of Nature Conservator instead of Warden. So kind of changing the vibe. With visitor numbers increasing every year, tourist infrastructure was starting to improve during the 60s. The first big camp, Olifants, was opened in 1960 and many more picnic sites were provided across the Kruger Park. It was also then decided like, look, we need to get some tar roads. So that's when they started to tar the main arterial roads. In 1969, the Makuleke area in the northern part of the park was forcibly taken by the Makuleke people by the government and about 1,500 of them were relocated to land south of their original areas um, so that the Makuleke area could be integrated into the Greater Kruger National Park. But that's bad. Don't steal people's land. On the 13th of March 1970, the chief biologist, Dr. Yu D. V. Pinar, was promoted to be the nature conservator. He replaced A.M. Brainard. Brainard. The 70s were mostly not much happening. The most notable thing was an extremely dry spell where all the rivers dried up and that left like a lot of hippos dead in the rivers. That was rough. But then after that, there was an abundant wet cycle. So that was like the 70s. The 70s also reintroduced, they reintroduced black rhino to the park, which had been extinct since the 40s. Um, so that's the 70s. By the 1980s, it was becoming clear that the National Parks Board needed to take a hard look at the racial discrimination against visitors who were from different race groups other than white people. So not only was there a steady demand growing for people from other race groups to visit the Kruger, obviously magical place, everybody wants to visit. There was actually really bad things happening at the park daily during peak periods when visitors had to be denied into the white facilities in the park, which is really disgusting. Um, so although not allowed to go as far as complete desegregation, the board decided in June 1981 to open the restaurants to all races and to create more and equal facilities for the other race groups. So, I mean, I guess that's good. They started improving from the 1980s, 1981. It was only by the end of the 1980s that the segregation of visitor facilities was completely abandoned. In May and June 1981 onwards, elephant poaching escalated dramatically in the northern part of the Kruger Park. Mozambican poachers were armed with AK-47s, they shot and killed numerous elephants for their ivory in the area between the Lataba and Chinguezi rivers close to the Mozambican border. After extreme intensive anti-poaching measures that were introduced to the park, uh, poaching stopped almost completely by the end of 1983. The park's tourist infrastructure was significantly expanded and modernized during the 80s. Starting in 1983, 10 new camps were built across the park uh, existing camps were then modernized and expanded. They even built new tar roads during this time. In July 1985, Liechtenstein's Hartebeest were reintroduced into the park, uh, which is really cool. They continue to reintroduce new species. They introduce a white rhino as well. So bringing in new species into the park and making it a more premium uh, location. It's quite interesting. Despite sharing a border with two hostile states, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, the Kruger Park was surprisingly not really affected by political turmoil in Southern Africa during the 1970s up until 1994. Kind of the most serious incident that took place in the park was the Gonde Gonde incident, which took place in July of 1988. This was where a park vehicle detonated a landmine a few kilometers south of Pafuri. Luckily, nobody was hurt during the landmine explosion. Over the following two days, park staff tried to follow footprints to the Gonde Gonde Hills near Shinguizi, where they came under heavy gunfire. A South African Air Force helicopter gunship was called in to help the park staff, and a day later, two insurgents were killed 
close to the main entrance of the Shingredzi rest camp. So that's kind of the only turmoil that happened within the park, which is interesting. In 1996, finally the Makuleke tribe submitted a land claim for 19,800 hectares um, in the Pufuri or Makuleke region of the park, the northernmost part of the park. The land was actually given back to the Makuleke people. However, they chose not to resettle on the land itself, but to engage with private companies to invest in tourism in that area. So they actually own the Makuleke concession and they get money back from letting it out to touring companies for tourists to attend, visit. This, re this resulted in the building of several game lodges from which they own royalties. In the late 1990s, the fences between the Kruger and Klaseri Game Reserve, Olifants Game Reserve and Balule Game Reserve were dropped and incorporated into the Greater Kruger National Park with 400,000 hectares added to the reserve. In 1998, the first black director of the Kruger National Park, Madoda David Mabunda, was appointed. Really cool, good progress. In 2002, the Kruger National Park, Ghana Rajur National Park in Zimbabwe and Limpopo National Park in Mozambique were incorporated into a peace park which is now called the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park. So the parks, all three of them on the corners, they all drop their fences so animals can move from all those places. In the 2000s, rhino poaching started to become a big issue in the Kruger National Park, with numbers increasing rapidly between 2000, 2000 and 2014. An anti-poaching effort was put into place in order to reduce the number of rhino poached. In addition to having a major effect on the rhino populations, the poaching also poses a long-term threat to tourism in the Kruger. In 2012, there was a dramatic rise in poaching, and this led to the formation of a new anti-poaching unit of the South African Police Force, SAP. So they actually created a unit to combat poaching. By the end of August 2015, there were 749 rhinos poached in the park that year, which exceeded the nationwide total for the previous year to that point. So it got really bad in the 2010s area. By 2018, poaching in Kruger was decreasing a bit as poachers moved to new areas such as Kuzuli Natal. On the 24th of July, 2019, Sand Parks announced the arrest of nine additional poaching suspects between 20 July, 2019 and 23 July, 2019. Despite an overall decrease in rhino poaching in Kruger, 190 were still killed in 2019 and there were 1,200 poaching related incidents recorded in the first half of 2019. So it's still bad, but there are being strides made to put in place to combat that. In March 2020, we all know COVID struck and the park was closed for a long time. There's really cool photos of the wildlife kind of taking over the park, which I thought was really cool. Um, and then the park again was reopened in August 2020. So that's Kruger, it's history from as far as I could find. Uh, if you haven't visited the Kruger, I highly suggest you do. It's a really amazing place and you could be one of the over a million people that enter the Kruger during any year. And now when you go there, you'll hopefully know some of the history and appreciate it even more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Let me know if there's anything you want me to research and I will do so. Cheers, cheers and have an amazing day. Bye. Thank you.